Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Valdiv Pinder. Welcome to our webinar today on arbitration and court measures for getting your claims and getting your recoveries through. I am very grateful to be joined with an esteemed panel today. I have Mr. Raj Panchamatia from Ketan & Co. in Bombay, and I've got the team from El Tamimi & Co. in Dubai, Naive Yaya and Stephanie Melhame. Thank you, gentlemen, and thank you, Stephanie, for joining us today. Um, we will, this panel will be fairly interactive between the three sets of lawyers. We will be talking about how to use arbitration, how to use court procedures, and how to use other interim measures in our respective jurisdictions. We've got a fair amount to cover, uh, so I think we will cut, we will, we will kick off uh, straight right in. The first half of the presentation will be talking about arbitration and court procedures and which ones are better suited for certain types of claims. And in the second half of the session, we will deal with restructuring and the recent COVID measures that have come in, including COVID moratoriums that have come in uh, that has impacted on the restructuring process in our respective jurisdictions. So let's jump straight in. There is uh, a lot of debate, uh, a lot of feedback from, from clients and users of arbitration as well. And the, taking a step back, I think the general consensus really is uh, how does one start to navigate the process? How, how does one start to navigate whether to do arbitration or whether to go to court? There are some pros and cons between the two systems. And I think Raj and I can speak to that in our respective common law jurisdictions. But I wanted to start straight away with Dubai and in particular, uh, the unique system that Dubai has, because Dubai has both, not both, has common law, has civil law, and also has a very healthy arbitration regime, all in one, all in one jurisdiction. So Naif, I was wondering whether you could uh, talk us through with some of these considerations between arbitration and court. Uh, thank you so much, Baldiv, and I would like to start by uh, thanking Blackstone and Gold uh, for hosting this uh, webinar, and I hope that uh, all the audience will find it informative and helpful to, to everyone. And thanks to the audience for participating as well. Uh, uh, le let me start with uh, explaining a very important point uh, before I answer your question, that uh, from most of the jurisdictions that come to enter into contracts in the UAE jurisdictions and in Dubai, we find that uh, a lot of foreign companies prefer to uh, choose their foreign court as the dispute resolution forum to settle any dispute. That's the first tip that I would like to highlight to all the audience. Don't choose foreign courts when it comes to uh, 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 contracts concluded in the UAE because this agreement is void. You cannot agree on Singaporean courts, you cannot agree on Indian courts, you cannot agree on any foreign court because that is again is the public policy in the, in the UAE and the agreement to any foreign court is going to be rendered by local courts as null and void. So that's a very important tip for all the foreign companies who enter into agreements in the UAE you shouldn't agree on uh, foreign courts. That's an important aspect that I wanted to start off with. The second aspect, which is the question that you raised, Baldiv, is the issue of choice of forum in the UAE and in Dubai particularly. Uh, as you said, Dubai is, or UAE in general, is a unique place where we will have the three systems, the arbitration, common law courts, and the civil law courts. Common law courts is uh, including the uh, DIFC court, the Dubai International Financial Center uh, courts, and also another court that was recently introduced, ADGM courts, which is Abu Zabi Global Market Court. Both courts are common law based uh, courts, uh, including English judges, and uh, some of uh, uh, the judges are specialized judges. Uh, uh, in the DIFC recently, a couple of years ago, they have even introduced a construction division to settle uh, construction disputes with judges specialized in construction uh, disputes. So both courts, you will have specialized judge, judges, very well experienced, uh, even there are some judges from Singapore as well. Uh, the choice become more difficult when you have three choices, not only two. In other jurisdictions, when you have only arbitration versus courts, 
some people struggle anyway, but here in Dubai, people even struggle, struggle more. My personal preference when it comes to normal debt recovery cases, straight for, straightforward uh, contracts, my personal preference is not to go to DFC or uh, common law courts or arbitration. You should simply agree on local courts. The process is fairly easy, not very expensive, and it's uh, very quick to uh, get your result. Especially we have also a lot of interior measures where we can put pressure on the debtors and we can obtain freezing injunctions, we can obtain direct payment orders, which is considered in other common law uh, jurisdictions as a default or summary judgment. And it's not available in some of the other uh, options we have. Although the IFC and, uh, DFC and common law- Yeah, do, do, do you mind if I just ask a quick question there, if I stop you there, sorry to interrupt. But you've Problem. got the common law courts, and then you've got the local courts, and you're saying your preference is for the local courts because there are some mechanisms available to it that might not be available in the common law courts. And you mentioned freezing injunctions and uh, summary judgment, for example. And these are quicker yes. ways of getting to the to get to getting a judgment. Uh, is it correct that that wouldn't be available in the common law courts, or uh, are there special quirks about the lo about the local courts that are not available? Right, okay, it is available in the common law courts, uh, uh, of course, because the, it's a common law system where you will have all the interim remedies available with any common law courts. It's available also, you have summary judgments in the DFC and the EDGM courts, but I'm saying that uh, because the common law courts are kind of more expensive and it can be very costly sometimes, and it's also sometimes lengthy pro lengthier uh, process, where in Dubai or local courts, you will find it more cost efficient and uh, time efficient as well. So that's why I prefer in the straightforward case, just to make sure that everyone understand my comment, I'm talking about straightforward cases. My preference is local courts as opposed to arbitration or common law courts. But when it comes to more complex disputes, construction disputes, ener energy projects, complex finance transactions, we always prefer a better uh, uh, setup like arbitration and uh, uh, common law courts because of the specialization we have in, in those forums where in local courts, we may struggle with uh, uh, the, the specialization of judges and also the experts appointed by the court in, in the relevant cases. I, I, uh, I ask it, believe to share the uh, a couple of charts that I have prepared in order to uh, provide the audience with uh, uh, an idea of uh, how to choose the forum. We have prepared this uh, chart to uh, considering the relevant factors where you should consider before you make the choice which forum you could you, you should elect under your uh, respective uh, contracts when you come to the UAE. I, not, I don't intend to cover all of them because of the time, but we will share them, we'll share the chart following the uh, uh, webinar, but just to give you a high level comparison between the three jurisdictions, for example, the nature of the dispute itself, sometimes it's not available to agree on arbitration on all contracts, including, for example, commercial agency contracts, some of the real estate transactions, you cannot go to arbitration. Uh, on the other hand, you can agree on all sorts of disputes to be referred to local courts. Uh, uh, cost, in terms of cost, common law courts and local court uh, and arbitration are much more expensive than uh, uh, local courts. Uh, language in, in local courts, it's Arabic, the arbitration, uh, uh, and the common law, the arbitration is the choice of the parties. It can be Arabic, it can be English. The common law courts only English. Uh, if, the, if, if, if the contracting parties would like to have um, uh, the confidentiality a key factor when they choose the forum, then the best place to go is arbitration because of the confidentiality obligation, whereby in the common law courts, it's unfortunately fully pu public. The hearings are public, even the judgments will be published uh, 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 publicly. Un unlike local courts where it can be semi-confidential, where the hearings are public, but the judgments will not be announced or published. So that's a general uh, 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 overview of the relevant factors that you should consider. 
uh, where you will see the list of factors that will share it with the participant following the uh, presentation. But my personal preference, local courts in straightforward cases, complex than sometimes common law courts and sometimes arbitration. Thank you, Naif. Thank you for that. Could we give the audience a sense of timing? So in Singapore, for example, if you start an action in court, if the defendant doesn't show up, you can get a default judgment in uh, as early as two weeks, on average, maybe one month. Summary judgment, because the person doesn't have a proper defense, you can get in about three months on average. Uh, what's the timeline like in the UAE? For summary judgments, we call it direct payment order. We can get it X40 in an, as an X40 application, and it takes between three to uh, five days uh, uh, once the application is filed with the judge. So it's much more quicker than any other court because it's X40. It's not uh, you don't have to notify the uh, uh, defendant. Put the application to the demand notice. Yeah. So the, the creditor will send a demand notice, grants the debtor five days to settle the outstanding, and then he can proceed with filing the application. Perfect. Sounds very, uh, very ruthless, actually. Raj, coming over to you, uh, as an arbitration specialist in particular, I, I wanted to get your sense of, your, your, your sense of arbitration versus court. Uh, in particular, I would imagine that arbitration has boomed for many years now because it was, uh, or it is, a more efficient way of, of adjudicating a claim than going through local court processes, which could take, uh, well, some countries could take notoriously long. And I think the arbitration could do it fairly quicker. And is that still the case from your experience? Are there, uh, where are you seeing issues with arbitration in today's world? Uh, so, uh, no, first of all, uh, thank you, Baxter and Gould, for inviting us for this session. Thank you, Valdiv. Uh, uh, so, uh, I'll tell you, uh, keeping in mind India as a jurisdiction, uh, India, by and large, has a huge amount of case, uh, cases that come to court on a regular basis. Therefore, alternate dispute resolution for India was a key for a success. Uh, what it has uh, also done is India has in the last five years come out with two amendments to its Arbitration Act. And some of the amendments are very path-breaking, uh, such as bringing in timelines to complete domestic arbitrations. Uh, till 2019 amendments, those timelines also apply to international arbitrations uh, seated in India. So what we did was we could quickly complete arbitrations within 12 to 18 months. Uh, so it was 12 months. You have to complete in 12 months with consent, uh, another six months. If you can't finish within period of 18 months, you go to court for extension of time, which helped you to complete arbitration very, very quickly. And That's pretty drastic. That's pretty, I, I think there's no country in the world that has a timeline that way. Uh, and how has the experience been yeah. handled then? You have to do it within 18 months. Absolutely. So you, uh, if, if it's by consent, you do it in 18 months. If it's otherwise initially, it's only 12 months. By consent, you extend to 18 months. And thereafter, if you want more time, you go to court. And then court, you have a good, good justifiable reason as to why you need further time. Like this helped a lot in clearing a lot of backlog of arbitrations. The smaller arbitrations started uh, getting over within a period of 12 to 18 months, which earlier could take a lot more. Smaller arbitrations started getting over very, very quickly. The larger complicated disputes are taking a little longer, but courts they have also been very, uh, I would say, very realistic in its approach and has seen where the matters require ex additional time. Courts have actually granted those time uh, without interfering too much. It's only in one or two matters that courts have actually uh, put severe conditions. Uh, otherwise, by and large, courts are looking and seeing that there is a progress. If there is a progress, the court will grant you extension. So I think in India, the arbitrations are moving much faster now than it was earlier. The only thing that happened recently in the 2019 amendment was that these timelines, which were made applicable earlier to domestic arbitration and to international arbitrations, 
it's now only applicable to domestic arbitrations and not applicable to international commercial arbitration seated in india well that's a problem though then yes. so there's no timeline yes. for international arbitration for international commercial international commercial arbitration unfortunately now there is no timeline but because most of them are governed by either ciac rules or icc rules or any of these institutional rules they tend to still get over pretty quickly understood understood and i i'll take my experience from doing arbitration as well and i think i put a video a video up quite recently on the problems with arbitration and i'm sure the arbitration community is not quite happy with me but these are some of the problems that you see happen in our arbitration the biggest problem is consent everyone needs to agree to arbitration it's a, it's a it's a warm fuzzy feeling sort of mechanism and so with third parties who don't want to play ball with you it is very hard to get a hold of them it's very hard to uh if you are a buyer and seller buying and selling goods it's very hard to get the surveyor involved into the arbitration very hard to get the the carrier involved into the arbitration all of these third parties will say listen hands up i'm not part of this agreement i i don't want to uh take part in it and the difficulties that i raise are not done just so that i can uh uh, uh point it out i think the important part about it is the solutions to that as well what are the ways you can get around some of these problems and i would think that ultimately arbitration needs to work together with the court so if you can if there are certain limitations available in arbitration then the the reason arbitration must work together with the court and the court can give you some of these remedies uh is that been your experience in india yes i think uh, uh, i think arbitrations and courts play a very complementary role to each other they complement each other wherever required so in uh, we've seen courts helping uh, uh, in the case of injunction where there are absolute necessary to go to court for an injunction against third parties courts stepping in and giving you injunction orders uh, we've seen when you need assistance for uh, as an arbitrator needs an assistance for an expert witness uh, to come in uh, uh, you can go to court and seek court assistance for leading expert evidence uh, so th- there are ways and means with, in which courts always assist in expediting arbitration in fact courts have now gone ahead and said that uh, arbitration sh- should are equally important as courts are because they are helping resolving disputes and re- re- reducing backlogs from the courts so that's something uh, the courts has started to recognize in big way understood so let me ask a question that i um uh, i get asked the most and the question is this when it comes to recoveries when it comes to debt claims and so on you want to start an arbitration it contains an arbitration clause you want to start an arbitration but there's a huge cost you have to pay to run the arbitration it's a private mechanism you have to pay the arbitration center and the arbitrator that cost you have no idea whether you are going to get that money back and so a lot of clients come to me and say am i throwing good money after bad why can i just go to court because if i go to court there's a default judgment the person doesn't show up i get judgment and i'm done or there's summary judgment as there is in the uae as well you've got this summary processes what would you say uh, and this question is both to naif and to yourself what would you say to a client that says i know there's an arbitration clause in the contract but you know i foresee some difficulty and i don't want to waste my money i just want to go to court what would you say to them maybe we start with uh, raj with yourself first so uh, uh, i would say that look at what you want immediately if you want a freezing order on certain assets of a party quickly move the court and then move to arbitration because that's where your proceed your arbitration your matter will get over quickly if you go to court uh, you will get your freezing order but not necessary that your matter will be heard that quickly because there is enough backlog in the courts itself so going to courts for a final hearing in in, in india is it's time consuming it's not going to happen very very quickly while there is a new act that has come in in 2018 uh, the commercial courts act which mandated that the commercial disputes need to be uh, disposed of within a period of one year 
but practically uh, there is just way too much backlog to complete that so arbitration i would say definitely is would be much faster but yes you also need to then factor in that there will be challenge to an award and then there will be appeal to that uh, so you factor that but we've also seen that a lot of lot of clients and a lot of uh, a lot of them want to consider whether we could use insolvency as a pressure tactic moving an application for insolvency as a pressure tactic because insol nclts national company law tribunals are mainly for resolution but people use this also as a pressure tactic to see if we try and take a company into insolvency mode will they be willing to resolve the matters quicker correct do you think that i mean but i mean under singapore law and most people don't seem to understand this is that that's not the correct use absolutely you are absolutely uh, right you make someone insolvent if they are unable to pay as and when the debt is due it is not a recovery mechanism uh, and when 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 you go to court and you try to make someone insolvent the the court can easily turn around and say well do you have a basis to do, to say so just because the company hasn't paid doesn't mean it's insolvent uh, and this is an important point to bear in mind and this is a big debate that goes about in all the jurisdictions now whether whether you can take a company to insolvency whatever your motivation is if there is an arbitration underlying in the contract and i think different jurisdictions view it differently now if if i could come to you uh, with the same question as well in terms of in terms of arbitration versus court uh, what would you tell the clients that perhaps are more keen to go to court than to go to arbitration Uh, right thank you Bandeep I think that it's a very important question and we face it on a daily basis with clients where they are not really encouraged to pursue arbitration because the cost because of the the absence of any assets to uh, enforce the award against and therefore the most of the clients who are faced and especially in this difficult time they will try to avoid the arbitration and go to court and uh, in this case it, there are a few strategic uh, litigation strategy that we deploy sometimes in order to avoid the arbitration but it doesn't work work all the time sometimes we try to uh, invalidate the arbitration agreement by arguing that the person who signed the arbitration agreement on behalf of our client doesn't have the requisite capacity to bind the company in arbitration where under the UAE law you need a special authorization to bind the company in arbitration but not all the time it work because recent judgments especially in light of the new uh, arbitration law in the UAE it's more uh, friendly with arbitration now so recent judgments made our life more difficult to go to court when we have an arbitration clause unfortunately but at the same time there are many other strategies that we can deploy including joining third parties if we, the, the application to join third parties is real and you have a real ground where for example a director acted in bad faith and have misconduct or is personally liable uh, in this case if we join the company and the director maybe we have a chance to uh, uh, avoid the arbitration but again it's not easy and maybe the court will end up deciding that it doesn't have jurisdiction and reject the case against the director because in order to establish personal liability takes a bit of an effort but there are few other ways uh, uh, but it will obviously it will take time to explain all but it's not easy like the chances of success to avoid arbitration is like not more than 40 50% i appreciate that you brought that up and i think the big the common theme that we come across sometimes is when trying to go to court is saying a few things number one the document the sales contract the the contract the loan has been forged uh and so if it has been forged then there's no binding arbitration agreement they should go to court number 2 the person signing the document doesn't have the requisite authority and these are sort the of issues um uh, will then in singapore at least it is for the arbitrator to decide that issue the arbitrator has got the power to decide whether he or she has jurisdiction over this issue so if the document is forged the arbitrator decides whether it's forged and when the arbitrator decides it's forged then you go off to court 
But if it's not forged, uh, then the arbitration car carries on. Raj, if I bring it back to in this um, vein, when it comes to criminal offenses, and I think Naive brought up the situation where you're suing, let's say you want to go after the company because of uh, uh, non-payment, but also the directors have got some bad faith involved in this as well. In the case of criminal offenses, where you think there's a non-payment, number one, but there's also something criminal, embezzlement of money, uh, misrepresentation of, of sorts that might be criminal in nature. How would you propose going about handling that? So uh, in India, uh, fraud in uh, the courts have held that if there is an egregious nature of fraud, those frauds cannot be arbitrated. Other than that, just the mere allegation of fraud or somebody saying that there is a uh, there is a fraud in this transaction and therefore fraud in this transaction and therefore it should not be arbitrated is not good enough uh, but criminal uh, where you say that there, are, there is criminality involved and you are able to establish that there is a criminality that, that will go to the criminal courts because criminal courts at the end of the day is a court which is going to grant you penalties it's going to or to punish you, but it is not the court which is going to give you be, or allow you to recover the money. For recovery, you will still have to follow the civil process to recover your money. That's a great so, point. That's a great but, point. But you will still need to recover that money through the civil process. You can't recover the money through the criminal process unless there are certain instances where you say that this are, these are proceeds of crime or that uh, there was a theft and then you make an application for return of property. Understood. That's a very good a point. criminal in nature. Very good point. Because uh, when seeking recovery, creditors sometimes want to start criminal proceedings, but they don't, they don't know that you cannot get your money back from criminal proceedings. Uh, the criminal proceedings is meant to, meant to uh, punish. Civil action is meant to give you recovery, meant to give you restitution, meant to compensate you for the loss that you have suffered. Naive, I want to ask the same question in the UAE, and this is very, uh, there are a lot of common conceptions or misconceptions about criminal offenses in the UAE, one of it naturally being signing a check and not and having a check bounce. Uh, a lot of that, that's often raised an example as a criminal offense and people running away and leaving their Ferraris at the airport. I, I, I what, what, what's your sense in terms of uh, criminal offences that work in parallel with a civil claim? A yeah, very good question. Thank you. I'm glad that you brought the issue of bounced checks specifically because just I have an update to the audience that only yesterday or the day before that UE government announced that they will they will decriminalise the the bounced checks crime and it will no, no longer be a crime in the UE. That's a good news for the debtors. Of course, it's a nightmare <laughs> for the bank, <laughs> but I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good step because a lot of other jurisdictions, they don't criminalize the checks and it's only a payment instrument in most of the jurisdictions. So now I think it's a good step and a lot of uh, 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 helpful impact to the economy uh, uh, with respect to this uh, bounced checks because a lot of investors are afraid to invest in certain countries where you have this tough punishment when it comes to commercial transactions or any sort of civil transactions. Uh, back, back to your questions, uh, uh, the issue of a forged document, uh, I agree with you, Baldiv. I think it's a very tricky uh, question that we always face, whether or not the tribunal or the arbitrator will have jurisdiction to hear a dispute where the agreement of, on arbitration is is included in a forged document? My answer is actually uh, it's a yes. Uh, they, sh they should have jurisdiction based on the principle of competence, competence. But at the same time, uh, uh, the practice and the, the judge's reaction, they don't really respect the issue of competence, competence, where you have a forged document. The original agreement to arbitrate is forged and therefore most of the judges will accept jurisdiction once there is an evidence that this document which contains the arbitration agreement is forged. So that's the reaction of the judges that I have seen in the past in, in cases that we handled. 
on the, on the other question about embezzlement or fraud involved by the directors or any other criminal issues other than the forgery, uh, uh, you need to make a distinction between the criminal action that you are going to take. Obviously, that has nothing to do with the arbitration. But when you file the civil action itself, it can be it can go to arbitration if the tribunal or the court think that the basis of the claim is not the crime but the contract and the contract is not forged and therefore the jurisdiction will lies with uh, will lie with the arbitration still but if the court believes that the basis of the claim is the crime or the, the criminal action and the damages caused by the crime then the arbitration shouldn't have jurisdiction and you should go to file your case in, 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 in the court. Understood. Understood. If, I may just, if I may just come in here, so the threshold to establish that there is a fraud is very, very high because if parties have already acted on the agreement and they have performed the parts of the agreement, but when it goes into dispute and then you go to court and say that there is this agreement was a fraudulent document, it's very high threshold to, uh, to run through the courts. But uh, so I think that it's uh, by and large, it will be arbitrators who will be asked to go look into it whether there was at all a fraud or not. I think in, in both ways, even if the threshold is high, you will end up waiting for the, the criminal court anyway. The civil Absolutely. court and the tribunal have an obligation, in my opinion, to uh, suspend any civil proceedings pending the resolution of the criminal action, especially if the grounds of the case of the basis of the claim relates to the crime. So that's an issue that we will have to wait and see the fraud and, uh, and the crime itself by the criminal court. Yeah. But there is something in the UEE code, civil fraud, like if there is any civil fraud or bad faith by the debtor, then this has nothing to do with criminal action and it can be heard by arbitration. Understood. Now, if we've got a question on the issue of balance checks, from the audience and uh, naturally they're very concerned that the law has changed. They've asked when is this new directive coming into or has become effective? Not yet, uh, but I think uh, we are expecting it in the next few days, but we haven't seen the, uh, or the, 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 the law was not actually uh, 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 published in the Gazette yet. But we also the, heard that it did not enter into effect before 2022. Yeah. So we still oh, have time. Yeah, that's still a while away. We can you know, plenty of fudge checks to sign before. <laughs> no, but 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 it, there was a decision made uh, uh, by the government to amend the commercial transactions law and to decriminalize the uh, bounce check, but with certain conditions that we are not aware about yet. Understood. One more question to do with the UAE that comes from the audience is: uh, you mentioned at the start of the session that. Uh, pick pick a local court. That's your preference. You have a local court. You cannot you cannot if it, if it's a if it's a contract signed in the UAE, you cannot specify a foreign court that is null and void. Uh, what about the governing law? Must the governing law be local law as well? Perfect. That's a very good question, and it's one of the factors in the chart that I provided to you, believe that we would share with the audience following the webinar. The foreign court, the foreign law choice, you are free to choose foreign law in arbitration, obviously. You are free to choose foreign law with common law courts, but with local law courts, although the civil code allows the parties to agree on a foreign law, but in practice, judges ignore the application of the foreign law, except in certain cases like family cases and few other examples, they apply foreign law, but in civil and commercial cases, they will more likely, or the judges, the local judges in the UAE, they will more likely ignore. So one of the factors to consider when you choose the forum, if you want to apply Singaporean law as an example, then don't choose local courts. Go for arbitration or the IFC court as an example. Understood. That's very helpful, actually. I think you need to streamline your governing law and your choice of the court at the same time so that that both makes sense. I'd like to move on to... But, uh, sorry. Sorry, but Dave, uh, but the two things are different things, just the audience to make it clear, because we see very 
or disaster uh, arbitration clause or uh, uh, dispute resolution clauses where you mixing up between the governing law and the jurisdiction. Jurisdiction in one thing, on, on the other hand, the governing law is another thing. Sure, sure. Um, so for the benefit of the audience, the governing law goes towards the substance of that, uh, the, the merits of the parties, their obligations, the rights and obligations intersay between the parties. And the jurisdiction is where you go to to hear that dispute. And jurisdiction more touches on procedural issues on how that is how that is resolved. I wanted to move on to restructuring because I know we have a lot of content to get past. And with restructuring, perhaps I will start first with Singapore uh, to give a general overview of to the restructuring process. I'll take a few minutes and maybe share a screen because in every newspaper in the world, Singapore's restructuring regime uh, gets brought up. And Singapore is a very comprehensive restructuring regime. It's recently undergone some changes. And I wanted to just give a very brief overview as to what the three options are. Number one, you can go for what is called a scheme. A scheme comes under section 210 or section 64. Uh, uh, and a scheme is supplemented with a moratorium. So a moratorium is to prevent any further action taken against the company. Number, the second option is that you have a judicial management. You hear the word judicial management all the time in Singapore. And the key difference between the two, between a scheme and a judicial management, is that in a judicial management, a third party is running the company. In the scheme, the, the present directors are still running the company to try to keep it going. In a judicial management, Obviously, there must be concerns with, uh, with the conduct of the directors. And so a third party runs the company going forward. Then there is, uh, then there's liquidation, which everyone is quite familiar with. I've, I've prepared some slides with the process for a scheme and for a, ju a judicial management. And a scheme that is used in Singapore, when they use the word scheme, they mean court protection, which is a moratorium under section 64, and the scheme is section 2110. I wanna to touch very briefly on a scheme because I am set in court a lot of times and I'm left telling lenders or telling creditors uh, that some of what I see doesn't seem to make sense when it comes to restructuring. A lot of the times when a company is unable to pay its money, uh, and it goes and applies for restructuring. It wants protection from the court so that it can restructure its debt. Not enough questions are asked as to the business plan of the company or the assets of the company or the receivables of the company in particular. I've raised these considerations over here because in my experience of doing restructuring, you have three uh, planks to a restructuring plan. One is the debtor comes and says, oh, I'm sorry, I, I owe all this money, but there's a white knight coming in that will pay me additional money. And with this white knight capital, I will then restart the company. Number two, they would say, I have this massive amount of receivables, $500 million. I just need more time to stay alive so I can get the receivables. Number three would be their business plan. And, and for, um, for trading companies in particular, it's very difficult because their business plan would be, they can only do one thing. They only know how to trade. Uh, so if you're an oil trader, you're just going to be an oil trader. You can't, you might change your products, you might change your geographies, but the business plan is still the same. And I ask, uh, and I raise this point because too often when a plan is being put forward, the creditors aren't asking the right questions. The creditors aren't asking, the right questions to ask would be, if you are a trading company, the only way you can survive is through financing. Who is going to give you financing? Which new bank is going to give you financing? Which new counterpart is going to give you credit terms when they know that you are in a restructuring process? Number two, receivables that everyone claims that they owe so much uh, receivables or are owed so much receivables. Who has gone out to test whether the receivables are legitimate? And number two, whether they can be recovered. There's no point saying you have receivables due from, from very tricky jurisdictions because you cannot get recovery of this money. And if you were a creditor or if you were owing, if you owe money to a debtor, 
there's very little chance of you paying those receivables because you think the debtor will eventually get wound up anyway. So these considerations need to, need to be understood and the uh, lenders need to apply their minds a bit more. Creditors need to apply their mind a bit more. And often, often people are scared to put the company into liquidation, but in effect, some of these companies should go into liquidation. There is nothing left for them to actually uh, restructure, particularly companies that do not have any assets. If you're an asset-like company, there's not much you can, you can do to restructure. I'm going to stop there with the restructuring scheme in Singapore. And I want to, I'll share the slides at the end of the, at the, end of the session, but I want to uh, pass the floor over to Stephanie in the UAE, who's going to tell us more about insolvency and restructuring in the UAE. And in particular, Stephanie, if you could uh, let us know also about the impact of any COVID moratoriums that are on insolvency proceedings. Sure. Thank you, Belda. Um, basically, the UAE enacted its bankruptcy law in 2016 to cater for the needs of uh, the market, especially in the aftermath of the financial crisis that took place in 2008. The, the aim of the law is to instill investor confidence and to promote transparency in the process for creditors. So basically, the, the, the changes that were covered in this law were aimed at uh, helping debtors reach settlements with their creditors so that all the parties in the process uh, will, uh, will uh, gain. So um, uh, before going into the different options that are available under the bankruptcy law, I, I just want to cover who is uh, regulated by this law. So it's basically commercial companies operating in the UE and individuals that are considered as traders. Uh, the law does not apply to companies in uh, financial free zones that have their own set of insolvency laws, such as the DIFC and the ADGM that I have already discussed. So um, the three options that are available under this uh, bankruptcy law are, uh, two of them are actually court supervised options. And the third one is an out of court process. Regarding the supervised options, we have the preventive composition it's a mechanism that is available for the debtors only. They can apply to the court to commence the preventive composition proceedings if they're facing financial difficulties, but they do not meet the criteria for filing for bankruptcy. So they, they, this means that they did not stop paying their debts when they became due for a period of 30 days and that their assets are still sufficient uh, to cater for their liabilities. So uh, in this process, the court uh, may appoint an expert to give his opinion on the financial position of the debtor and uh, on the, the possibility of uh, the plan succeeding. And if the court considers the application uh, has grounds, it will accept it and appoint a trustee to uh, oversee the proceedings and help the, the debtor reach an, uh, an amicable agreement with his uh, creditors. So this uh, is all led by the court, and it's an intensive process that could result in rescuing the debtor. Uh, the other uh, option that is available is the bankruptcy and liquidation option. This option is available for both the debtor, upon meeting the conditions that I mentioned earlier, or creditors. Uh, basically, a creditor or a group of creditors whose debt does not fall below 100,000 dirhams, which is approximately $27,000, can uh, file the application to the court. Uh, the court will also, like the process is similar to the preventive composition process. The court can appoint an expert to give its views on the application. If the application is accepted, the court commences the proceedings, appoints a trustee, and considers the option of restructuring the debtor. Uh, but sometimes if the court considers that this option is not viable, it may uh, declare the bankruptcy immediately and liquidate the business. But, but usually courts try to uh, restructure the business in order to help the debtor, uh, rescue the debtor and uh, allow him to settle all his outstandings. In both uh, options, uh, the, the debtor is allowed to obtain new financing. And this is something positive in the law because eventually it may help the, the debtor pay his debts. And sometimes like the, the court will allow the debtor to uh, grant security. To the creditor that's extending the new financing to the debtor. Uh, uh, regarding the moratorium, recently the, the, the moratorium starts 
when the court accepts uh, to open the proceedings, whether they're uh, restructuring proceedings for bankruptcy proceedings or uh, uh, preventive composition. Uh, and uh, the, the moratorium remains, so no judicial proceedings may be filed, no enforcement actions may be taken against the debtor during this phase until uh, the restructuring plan or the preventive composition plan is approved by the court. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, criminal action for bounce checks are suspended as well. So uh, the, 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 the debtor will actually be relieved from such criminal action and uh, uh, from any enforcement against his assets, but definitely secured creditors can still uh, take action against the debtor, and uh, they need they just need the court's authorization to proceed with enforcing their security, but they can still take uh, measures. And um, can uh, recently, how long liquidation takes in a, in uh, in the UAE? How long is the like liquidation? It depends. Months or years. The, it takes years. It's a very lengthy process. The law sets like very tight deadlines for the court to adhere to, but in practice, we're seeing that the, the timelines are being like extended and the court keeps on adjourning. For example, when the expert is appointed, he's required to issue his report within 10 days, but the court keeps on like uh, granting, uh, granting the expert extensions that could like reach to months and sometimes years depends and it depends on how many creditors uh, are involved in the process and uh, whether they're secured or not and uh, if there's an option for restructuring the debtor or not so uh, the the process varies significantly between a case and another just to add to what stephanie said some historic background that the, the new insolvency law or the bankruptcy law uh, was actually issued like in 2016, yes. where before the law was issued, the local courts in the UAE used to be uh, to, to decline or reject all the bankruptcy application except few cases. But after following the issuance of the new law, the courts started to be more friendly to declare uh, companies bankrupt, which is helpful to creditors in some uh, cases where the, the directors or where the companies, the debtors are dissipating their assets or acting in bad faith, then you can stop them from uh, uh, dissipating the assets by approaching the court to uh, declare them bankrupt uh, in order to stop the, uh, uh, the, the bad faith actions by the director. Just wanted to yes. add that that's a visible option nowadays in the UAE. Before 2016, all the lawyers used to say, the court will reject the bankruptcy. It's very rare for the judge to say, uh, to declare a company bankrupt. Okay. Yes, so basically, there's no back period of two years, starting from when the court accepts to open the proceedings. And you can uh, invalidate many transactions, such as gifts, uh, transactions made at an undervalue, uh, um, guarantees for uh, previous debts. So uh, all those actions may be uh, annulled by the creditors. And the that's, that's and one of the benefits for bankruptcy for this clue back period, the two years from the date when the judge declared the company bankrupt, I think, or from the opening the proceedings, opening. I think it's a very good advantage for creditors to invalidate certain transactions that was conducted in bad faith by the debtor. And that's the main advantage for creditors. Yes, I see that. I think I think that's common in many jurisdictions, the clawback or the unwinding of certain transactions, whether it is transactions at an undervalue yes. or transactions for an undue preference or um, transactions that shouldn't have been done, I suppose, within a certain time period before their insolvency. We have something unique in Singapore, and I wanted to see whether that position is uh, uh, um, the same in India. In Singapore, we had COVID legislation that has come through to protect companies against bankruptcy and insolvency in the past six months. Uh, the government over here very sensibly said, um, you can't make a company insolvent. And in Singapore, one of the ways to make them insolvent is that you issue a statutory demand. Uh, and if you don't pay within three weeks, then that's a presumption that you cannot pay and then you go into insolvency or you, you apply for insolvency. That, um, in the COVID legislation, they said for six months, you can't go against companies because naturally during this period, you don't want to put companies into insolvency. Their, their non-payment 
has less to do with insolvency, but more to do with the situation arising from COVID. That moratorium, the COVID moratorium, has come to an end on the 19th of October, 2020. That means that on the 20th of October, many, many statutory demands have been sent to many debtors. And within three weeks, you will see a fair amount of insolvency going on in Singapore. Uh, that's my suspicion, at least. What is the position in India for this, Raj? Uh, so, uh, India has also come up with a moratorium, but it has a little different uh, tweak than what Singapore has. Uh, Sing Singapore has permitted to to initiate uh, the resolution process or the insolvency notices post the lockdown period coming to an end or post the moratorium period coming to an end. In India also there is a moratorium period. So uh, the government came with a moratorium period starting from 25th March of this year. Till, uh, it, earlier it was in September, now it's been extended till end of December. You know, what they have come up with is if there was any default that was committed during this period, you cannot initiate any action against those defaults forever. So therefore, you will not be in a position to initiate action for insolvency of those companies if the defaults are committed during the moratorium period. You may, you may go to other foras, like you may go to court to recover your money. You may go to other tribunals like the debt recovery tribunal. You can go to arbitration, but you cannot take the company to insolvency because the default was during the moratorium period. And therefore, any, mo any default during the moratorium period, you cannot initiate any action against them. Wow, it's a free pass. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. It's a free pass, but you can still take them to arbitration. You can still take them to court. You That's right. So there is, it's not that there is a complete ban on recovery proceedings. You initiate your other recovery mechanism, but you can't take the company to insolvency. You can't declare a company insolvent because of a default during moratorium period. So okay. that's a protection that the companies are been given that they can't be declared insolvent during this period. Understood. Uh, we've got five minutes left and I wanted to, I, I, I don't know whether you can do it justice within such a short time. The NCLT is a very common uh, question that is asked by a lot of creditors on the use of the NCLT, which is the, the restructuring court in India. And uh, a brief overview of that, if you have the time. Sure, I'll try and keep it as brief as possible and as quick as possible. So uh, primarily, uh, you approach NCLT uh, for insolvency of matters uh, and the resolution process. Insol uh, NCLT was primarily constituted to restructure uh, to to come up with resolution process for companies which were debt-ridden. So if anybody is filing an application, so, so there are two ways, three ways you can file an application before, in, uh, before the NCLT. One is by a financial creditor who files under section seven. Then there is by an operational creditor and then the debtor itself can file for restructuring under section 10. So you file these three applications. Uh, if, uh, under, six, uh, under, seven, under seven, when there is a financial creditor, there is no need to give a notice uh, for default. The, uh, the financial creditor could straight away go ahead and file the insolvency proceeding if there is a default. For an op operational creditor, he needs to give a notice of 10 days uh, before he can initiate the insolvency process. Once the insolvency process commences, the petition will be admitted by the insolvency court depending upon if there is any pre-existing dispute or not. Uh, pre-existing dispute makes a difference when it is an operational creditor uh, claim. But in case of a financial creditor, a pre-existing dispute does not make any difference. It only looks at if there is a default and if there is a debt due and payable. In a financial creditor, if you are able to establish that, the petition will be admitted. But for an operational creditor, you will have to also show that there was no pre there is no pre-existing dispute because many a times the data comes up and says that there were pre-existing disputes and therefore the matter be referred either to courts or to arbitration as the case may be and a company cannot be liquidated. If the petitions are admitted then an interim resolution professional is appointed who take control of the management of the company who has to within a period of 30 days uh, uh, and call the meetings of the creditors 
get the list of the creditors, invite claims, constitute a committee of creditors. Committee of creditors is primarily all the financial creditors come together and form the committee of creditors. No operational creditors sit on the, on the committee of creditors. Uh, the IR, uh, this committee of creditors will also have the right to either confirm the appointment of the interim resolution professional as a resolution professional for the company or appoint a different resolution professional for the company. So he can actually replace the IRP. Sure. Then IRP also calls, uh, prepares a memorandum, information memorandum, and then invites uh, bidders bid for the company. How uh, long was the process? How long does he do this within? The entire process of resolution is 180 days, uh, and it and extendable by 90 days. If I can quickly show you one quick slide which will give you a broad overview of what it is. So uh, uh, this is a quick slide on uh, uh, IBC petitions admitted uh, and CIRP has been commenced and its corporate insolvency resolution process has been commenced. How the entire process will move. Uh, you will see it's a very straight jacket formula. It keeps moving very smoothly. It has to be completed within 180 days, extended by another 90 days. In the meantime, the moratorium kicks in and the suits proceedings cannot be initiated. No assets can be transferred. Uh, all kinds of proceedings come to a standstill. Uh, during the IRP process, the, the IRP also has a look back period of up to one year to look back if there were any other transactions that took place, which was, uh, which shouldn't have taken place. And eventually, uh, so the board of directors, uh, stand suspended, uh, NCLE appoints the IRP or replace, uh, to replace the management of the, of the management of the, of the company. IRP invites the claims and constitutes the committee of creditors. Resolution plans are invited from the eligible uh, resolution applicants. Evaluation by the resolution professional of the resolution plans that are submitted. The committee of creditors considers and votes on the on the compliant uh, resolution plan. Finally, decision uh, NCLT decided decision on the approval of the plan or liquidation order. So, if there is not a good resolution plan, which is viable resolution plan, then the NCLT may say go ahead and liquidate the company. Who, who so, decides? Who decides if it's a viable uh, resolution plan? So uh, the committee of creditors uh, goes through all the plans, and uh, they will consider whether uh, they are the, because the minimum that the company who's bidding has to bid at least the liquidation value. Sure. Uh, so if you are not getting any plans uh, above the liquidation value, uh, in most cases it will go down the uh, the, uh, the liquidation route. So th this is how the entire process works. And uh, when you see uh, all decisions uh, by vote of more than 66% of the voting share of the financial creditor. Uh, so th basically the COC will uh, look at uh, and, and decide on the resolution plan. And which will be approved by the NCLT. Understood, understood. And from your experience in using the NCLT, has it more or less kept within the time frame? Is it pretty clockwork? Now it is. Earlier it used to take a longer time, uh, but uh, after, uh, in the recent times it's now become mandatory to complete this entire process in the given time. Okay. Now Thank only you. thing is because of the uh, because of this COVID, all the timelines have been extended. Understood. Which I think happens everywhere in the world now as well. There's not yeah. much uh, that can be done about it. Uh, guys, thank you so much for your time. I'm conscious that we have reached six o'clock. I just want to spend 60 seconds summarizing our discussion um, today so that people don't get the wrong impression. I'm really sorry to interrupt, but there are a couple of uh, points on the restructuring, just an update for the audience that will sure. take a minute. That's what sure. I'd like to cover. It. So uh, recently, last week, the UAE cabinet approved uh, some amendments to the bankruptcy law in the UAE. Uh, it's re they are related to like exceptional circumstances like the COVID 
uh, crisis that we're facing because of the liquidity uh, crisis in the market. So basically, the the amendments allow uh, the credit the, the debtor not to file for bankruptcy if he, even if he meets the conditions at this stage because of the financial difficulties that are caused by the crisis. And uh, in addition, uh, if a, a creditor files an application during this phase, then the court will not look into it until the crisis is over. And those amendments do not just apply to like COVID uh, circumstances, they apply to circumstances of wars or natural disasters or any financial crisis that uh, occurs in the country. Uh, but uh, debtors are allowed to file for bankruptcy during such, uh, such times if they uh, meet the criteria and the court will, uh, will allow them uh, to, to reach an amicable settlement within a period of 12 months with their creditors. So, so these developments are very favorable to debtors, especially during this phase, and especially because of the financial problems that all the companies are facing uh, in the market because of the COVID. Yeah, and I just add one update also that uh, the hospitals, they uh, have a moratorium by way of a resolution by the ministry of, uh, of Health and the Ministry of Justice that uh, all cases should be suspended against hospital because of the financial or the, the crisis of COVID-19. Until the end of the year. Yeah, until the end of the year, but it can be uh, extended. Just wanted to give, uh, to give this. These no, very so helpful, extended. guys. I, I can understand you don't want to, yeah, you don't want to uh, liquidate a hospital at this time, I think. It would be, it would be uh, quite suicidal, I think so. Um, thank you once again, Naif and Raj, Stephanie, thank you so much for your help on this discussion. To round up, and uh, what I wanted to say is that I hope people don't get the wrong impression. I've raised difficulties with the arbitration process, not because arbitration is a bad mechanism. Arbitration is still the default mechanism. It is a good mechanism to have for international parties. The, 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 the feedback that we get during the discussion is that when it comes is for every party to assess what is the most likely claim that will result from their contract. If it's a pure payment obligation and the, the, the counterparty is based in a jurisdiction where courts might be more quicker or fast as it is in Singapore or it is in the UAE, then perhaps considering the court mechanism is not such a bad idea. In other countries where court processes, where arbitration is quicker than the, than the court processes, for example, in India, then naturally I would still think arbitration is your go-to mechanism. End of the day, arbitration can't work without court and the court can't work without arbitration. I think the two go hand in hand. Uh, as for restructuring, I think all throughout the world, people are, are doing different restructuring processes and they are, they are fine tuning it as they go along. The important point about restructuring is that you have it, there has to be an international cover you cannot have restructuring in one jurisdiction while assets are being stripped away in another jurisdiction. It has to be a fairly uniform process that goes across. All the jurisdictions have the same objective of trying to restructure the company, to rehabilitate the company, failing which liquidation is the only option. Okay, I think uh, we've taken it as, as far as we can today. There are a lot of questions on enforcement. Uh, unfortunately, we we'll might have to push it back to a different, a different time, a different day. Enforcement is a very, very long topic, and I think we can spend a whole hour just talking about enforcement. Thank you once again to the audience. Thank you for taking part. Thank you to my guests. Have a great day. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.